What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 31 of Into the Necrosphere. My name is Jackie Smith, your host as always, and joining me on the show, uh, or should I say making his triumphant return today, is uh, my good friend, Leorcifer. Uh, he is the proprietor of Infernum Tattoos, um, which uh, at the moment uh, happens to be wherever Leorcifer is in the world. Um, he, uh, he's been around for ages, uh, multi award winning tattoo artist, and also the guy who happened to give me my very first ink. So, uh, we had an absolute blast catching up. Um, we chatted about a whole bunch of stuff, including, uh, his career, uh, black metal, Pantera, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So, uh, that's coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, I also wanted to give you all the heads up on uh, next week. Uh, I'm going to be speaking to Charles Elliott of um, uh, Abysmal Dawn. So Abysmal Dawn just put out a new album on Season of Mist, uh, which is a absolute masterclass in brutal technical death metal. Um, he and I had a conversation about uh, the new album, about where the band's headed, about life in LA at the moment uh, during the uh, coronavirus lockdowns and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so, uh, that's coming your way next Tuesday. And remember that you can get a heads up on everything that's coming out, um, by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google podcasts, or wherever else it is that you listen to your podcasts on. Um, or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, hit the subscribe button and click the notifications bell and, uh, you will know exactly when a new episode lands. Uh, just also want to say thank you very much to everybody for their support, for, uh, continuing to watch the show. I swear, as I, every time that I interview somebody new, I, I tend to do some research on, on recent interviews that they've done. And I probably discover about two or three new metal podcasts every single time I do that. And, uh, you know, a lot of those podcasts are very good, um, and I know that there's only so much time in the day uh, that you have to spend between podcast listening, Netflix, video games, pornography, or however else it is that you spend your time. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, and I and I absolutely don't take people's uh, support lightly, and uh, it, it definitely motivates me to put out the best show that I possibly can. Speaking of which, um, after the interview, I'm going to be talking about some new music, uh, so I will be reviewing the new Ulcerate and the new uh, Werewolves records, uh, so taking on a, a bit of an Antipodean brutality theme. And then uh, straight after, I'm going to be uh, reading some news. And uh, I will be talking during that segment uh, a bit about the uh, recent split that uh, Lee Wollenschlager, uh, previous guest of the show, and my friend had with uh, Malevolent Creation. I woke up on Wednesday morning and I had a whole bunch of uh, DMs about that uh, on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. So uh, I will give you guys my my thoughts on what happened there. Um, I mean, I don't really know a huge amount, and, and even if I did, I, I probably wouldn't want to get in the middle of any squabbles or, or any soap opera shit, but uh, I've got some opinions, and uh, I will share them very shortly. Uh, but before that happens, uh, please join me in welcoming, uh, for the first time in 28 episodes, my good buddy, Leorcifer. <laughs> Disinverted cross I found in, well, I found it as a real cross, obviously, in uh, flea market in Germany. Mm. And uh, a few months ago, I went back from Germany. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it later if you ask, actually. Um, I brought a bunch of my shit. There's still a little couple other shit that I have there. And this is one of the first thing I grabbed with me, which you should have seen me on the train with it. That was a good one. That's a nine-hour train. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been known to travel with like a severed Jesus head and shit like that. I've done that in the States too. Um, the look on people's face is just priceless. Um, one of the things I found is my fucking old iPod. And I told you I lost my music a while back. Yeah. So it's an old, old iPod. Okay. But it's got all my music. And this is what I told you the other bit about acid bath, dude. I was just about to say, so, so that's how you've rediscovered them recently. It's not that I even rediscovered them, but yes. And you know what? Again, I got my old iPod. It's got, you know, from my Frenchies to everything that I ever had. My Panteras, my Slayers, my everything that I do not even care to listen to at this point. Mm. Let me tell you, brother. Acid Bath, Crowbar. Oh, yeah. You there that I was like, oh yeah, I forgot how good those good get. And you say Asabeth specifically, one of my last 
trips again at this point i don't remember if it was a month ago two months ago or fucking six months ago but when i got the ipod back i don't know the fact that everybody looks at me like oh this guy looks old already now he looks like really ancient with an ipod sitting there on an airplane but uh, because again i don't have my drugs now including my prescription drugs which are like xanax and other shit that i'll usually fly with so i'm awake throughout this fucking stupid long ass flights but what I do now, if I can, which I usually can, um, I'll just eat a bunch of weed. Which, if I eat weed or any kind of edibles, that shit kicks my ass more than heroin does, okay? It really yeah. is phenomenal how <laughs> it And it creeps on you. Yeah. Dude, I sat for a train ride from Copenhagen for four hours. I sat for like a 12-hour flight. With a dumb, dumb first time I ever smoked human weed in my life, kind of smirk on my face, listening to Acid Band, going like, fuck yeah, dude. And I forgot. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember how good they were. And I remember the lyrics, you know, fucking when death sleeps and dreams of you. I forgot how it levels up. Mm. I forgot how it goes up to like full on, like, Rrr! and I was like, fuck yeah, dude. This is why. I... And you posted this. And a friend of mine from Norway a few days ago, this girl, Trina, um, just posted the same shit you did. Oh, really? Album cover, song, and she's just like, hey, da-da-da. I can't remember what she wrote about it. And I basically comment almost word by word when I comment on yours. And I was like, fuck yeah, dude. I forgot how awesome those guys are. Yeah, no, I, I I got into them because I I um I was and still massively am into Goat Hall and uh, you know you kind of start looking into what what you know bands guys were in previously and Sammy was in uh, Acid Bath and you know it just 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 one well, thing led to the other. Their, was it Acid Bath, Agents of Oblivion, and then it's kind of like Sleep Became Home, right? Is it Sleep yeah, that yeah, Became yeah. Home? It's one of those. I I think I told you about this last time we talked. How just like black metal, um, the, the, that kind of like stoner rock has the same thing. They're all fucking super groups. They're all a bunch of talented people sitting together. And if it's two piece, three piece, four piece, they fucking rock. Mm. And you can hear that it's the same scenario, only missing one guy or having an extra guy. And especially with Acid Bat and Agent of Oblivion and shit, they're they'll remind you because of the name of the band or the name of, you know, again, the, the scream of the butterfly. They're very repetitive on it. Yeah. And I remember back in the day when I got into Stoner Rock, I was doing exactly what you were saying. I was like, well, you know, I would always have friends like, well, if you like this, those guys have five other bands. And I was like, you know, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, you like those guys? Well, there's a, uh, what was it? Uh, not sleep, what the fuck they're called. When they have Unida, they have the bigger band, Kayas. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, if you like Kayas, have you heard Unida? And they're like, what the fuck is Unida? And they're like, it's Kayas minus one. Yeah. And it, it was the same thing. And, you know, again, it, it, Stoner Rock is a no brainer for me because A, it's metal. B, I'm a fucking pothead for going on almost 30 years now. So that's really a no-brainer for me. I clearly remember gone the first years that I started really touring, even with Paul back then, and even a couple of years later, when he stopped going and I started going on my own. I remember doing it in San Francisco. I remember doing it in Italy almost every year. It was a blasting fucking convention in Milan. I'll never forget, they just shut down the hotel and everything. You would go, I would go to my room at the end of the day, smoking room, it's fucking Italy, it's smoking or not, it's smoking. And I'd go and take a bath, and I was hurting, my back was hurting, everything was hurting from working all day, nonstop. And I would lay there in the bath, and they had mirrors on the ceiling, and I was just laying there, put agents of oblivion, smoke a big ass joint in the bath at the end of the day with a pocket full of cash and a full day of fucking working after this is when I started having a little more name and shit and recognition mm -hmm. and it was like 
those were the ones I would listen to. I would not rock out or anything. It would be like the end of the day of like, uh, when death sleeps and dreams of you. <laughs> That's exactly what I felt like, you know, and this, I was like fucking uh, the whole, uh, what was it, the bleeding part. And it, it, like I told you, their lyrics are so non-PC. Oh, yeah, yeah. From, from the Hitler quotes to you name it. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything from the fact that they used, you know, kind of original uh, John Wayne Gacy artwork, you know, as the album cover, all of that sort of stuff. I mean, there was just what I love about them. And there, there is genuinely something very special about that New Orleans, Louisiana kind of sludge mm. core scene. And I think acid bath really kind of typifies that there's, there's, as you say, there's layers, there's something that's just a little bit off and they're like, it, it sort of attracts you to, to find out what the next layer is. And then you realize, shit, there's something even more evil <laughs> beneath this layer yeah. and you keep on digging and digging and digging it's just uh, it's it's hard to describe to somebody who's not really experienced it but all of the best bands out of that scene are like that i would go as far as to say you even hear that very clearly in this new um acoustic project that phil anselmo is doing so uh -huh. i don't know whether you've heard any of uh, of the songs i just put out two so far um the the, the project is called n minor uh, mm -hmm. there's one song in particular they've put out called um I th fuck man what is it called um on the floor i think the song is called um but fantastic it's like it's like if it's like if nick cave was born in louisiana that's Look. kind of the sort of music that it is but fantastic but it has that new orleans vibe to it that real kind of like sinister undercurrent again i i you know I, i'm not yeah i was gonna tell you i'm not one to promote drugs yes i am okay let's let, let get this clear Yes, I yeah. fucking am. I have no issue with this. If you can handle it, you can handle it. And hey, whatever fucking works for you. The same way that I was arguing always with people like, oh, Prince died from heroin. And it's like, Prince also became Prince from the same drugs. So don't forget that. Yeah. With that being said, look, from I Hate God to those guys, this was like... You know, the how deep does deep get is where that hit me. Yeah. Because, like I said, uh, um, look, I've, I've always been that guy. I, I'm not the guy, like I told you, I've never put needles in my arms. I've never done shit. Dude, I like getting high. I've never had any issue with that. I'm trying to be responsible about it. I'm not going to tell you I always have because we try to. That's the best we can do. But with that being said... I can see where they're coming from. I can see where... I actually just saw something about somebody sums up what Pantera brought to the table. And it's exactly that. It's... This was not just metal. This was not just angry riffs. This was not just... You could hear where they came from. You mm. could hear what they grew up on. You could hear that the people that they grew up on were not Sex Pistols. They're fucking Hank Williams. There are yeah. people like, there's a deeper vibe to it and there's stuff that comes with it. And I've, I've, it, it's inspired, it, it's nice to me to hear it, people break it down like this because again, I, I'm not one to really see it that way. But yeah, it makes sense in the same way of like sleep Making Jerusalem, yeah. taking ten thousand dollars they got given, paid whatever they needed for the studio for two hours, and spend the rest on all the drugs they could get their hands on. <laughs> yeah, in Jerusalem, and you can hear it. This is not, and again, like I said, I, I dude, I've been smoking weed. I, I'm one of those people again. Drugs, no drugs. I rather go down than up. I'm one again. I'm, 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 I'm old enough to admit that, dude, you put something in front of me, up or down, or I'll take it. But my preference as a pothead is going down, obviously. Hearing that, there's an extra deepness and downness to it. This is like, mm. those guys are not smoking weed, dude. Those guys are smoked way heavier shit <laughs> to sing this. And like I said, Crowbar. Crowbar has two, one or two albums that are really striking with me. Uh, I think I told you I got to finally, I've kept missing them for years. I finally got to see them of all places in Inferno in Oslo. Mm. A, they rocked the fucking house. Fuck yes. Rocked the house. Yeah. All these black metal people were like, 
You guys rule, okay? First of all. Second, um, Crowbar has the one song, Empty Room. And that is for me, for a depressive person, for somebody who likes to sit at home and dwell in their misery and this is where my art comes from and a lot of other shit. Empty Room was like, whoo! <laughs> You know, it was just such a different heaviness to it, deepness to it. Um, it, it, it it's just a different feeling. And, and you know what? I, I've actually, I've had that discussion with a guy in Parma in early February. I went to see Abba. I think it was Abba 1349 and, uh, VL Tamina, whatever it's called, the, the new band of uh, Rune Blasphemer and Tucker from uh, 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 Ultimas. Is that what it's called? I, yeah. I cannot pronounce it. Yeah. Either way, I'm a big friend of uh, Rune and Blasphemer for many years. I met Tucker a couple times, shit, and so it's always good to see those guys. One of the guys in the Abbott band obviously got me on the list. Da, da, da. We went there, you know, I went to see the show. And as I'm talking to somebody outside, Again, about music, you know, and it's weird because you know as well as I do. We always have those discussions worldwide. It is what it is. We're very similar people no matter where yeah. you come from when it comes yeah, to yeah. And the one dude is trying to say again, because he's about my age, his take on this and that, blah, 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 whatever. You know, I don't want to get off, off subject here. And I told him flat out, you know what, dude? I still choose my music till this very day on face value Hmm. you do it for me or you don't it's as simple as that i'll be the last one to fuck it i'm as juvenile as they come you can exactly what you said with acid bat you can sell me onto your album with putting gacy's painting on it right off the bat and you can turn me off for the same fucking reasons but with that being said it's it's the same thing and this is what when i hear those music and the guy was like i envy you I honestly envy you that you don't let the internet and the information get in your way. And I was like, look, I'm interested as much as you are. It's nice for me to hear this opinion or that opinion. I love it or hate it. I got nothing to fucking hide here. And it is what it is. Let's say what we talked about, black metal, about other shit. Look, dude, you get it or you don't get it. It is what it is. I know who I am fairly good by now since I'm fucking 43 years old and not dead. And that's really all there is to it. And this yeah. is why some of those bands, yeah, you sold me. You sold me the same way. What was it? Uh, uh, High on Fire. Oh, fuck yes. Dude, yeah. I like Sleep. Not my gig. I like a couple of songs. Boo fucking who, if you really ask me. High on Fire, motherfucker. That guy is a Jim Morrison. That guy is a one-man band. And yeah. he, he's the Glenn Bentons. He's the Phil Anselmo. He, he, yeah. He's having a good day. And when I heard High on Fire, I was like, fuck. And then I saw High on Fire when the early tours, even more. I was sold. I, yeah, I, was, yeah. I was like, I, I got nothing I can tell you. The same thing with y'all. The same thing with a bunch of them. Again, I'm the furthest thing from a musician. Being an artist means nothing. On the face value of it, just like I was when I was 12, you can sell me on to this. This is very, very simple. I can love it or hate it. You can make an album and be my favorite band. I can tell, be the first one to tell you it sucks or not. And that's really how I feel, like you said, the New Orleans, the other shit. Fuck, dude, it's it's deep. It's... it's, it's I, I I think the thing with uh, with you know your taste uh, you know I, I you and I might might have touched on this privately or we we spoke about it in the last episode but I genuinely do I don't give a fuck what what people think about the music I like there's still stuff that I like that you know any scenesters or, or elitists will go how can you listen to that that's that sucks you're a poser blah blah, blah. but as far as I'm concerned I've been listening to this music probably for longer than most of those people have been alive. I'll listen to whatever I want. I don't have to ask anybody's permission. To this day, I still think the first Static X album is fucking awesome. Yes. Um, you know, it's something like uh, like High on Fire or, or Crowbar. I mean, those guys just they don't they don't do any wrong for me. Whereas nah, there's a lot of um, 
you know, there's a lot of kind of like uh, the, the the sacred cows in black metal that as much as black metal is probably the main music I listen to, I listen to it and, I, and I'm like, well, this just doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't, I don't, it, that that visceral reaction there, that feeling where it's it's grabbing you by your, your insides and it's yanking you around. I just yeah. don't get it. When I hear when I hear dissection, for example, I hear Watain. I know I know a lot of people like those bands, and they probably get that feeling from it. But I don't. I feel like the genre is, you know, even when the even even when those guys were just coming out, but certainly in the last decade, the genre has moved forward to such a, a an insane degree that those bands just don't cut it for me anymore. If I hear Ruins of Beverest and I hear Dissection, I'm sorry, but the two aren't comparable. You know, I, I told you a friend of mine. Uh killed himself last year sadly one of my best friends this guy jack from wyoming and that guy dude that guy's been fucking sober for i think like 25 years or something like that he used to shoot math back in the day he's from wyoming that's what they do there and <laughs> hey, you're laughing dude anybody yeah. from Wyoming would not even give me shit for that that's literally what they do there regardless he's been clean for many years and shit he's one of the only people i ever met in my life that he will get high from listening to music, literally. Like you can see yeah. how energetic it is for him, right? And um, he went to see, I think I got him on the list for Mayhem or something when they went out there a few years ago. And it was Mayhem and Watain tour, right? It was like, what, two or three years ago again. My, my, like I told you, I like my drugs. I can't tell you exactly how long ago yeah. this was. Um, he went to the show. And I loved his reaction to this. Jack's been good friends with they kill the Kardashians. Yeah. The whole thing, dude, that's Jack's thing. Okay, just so you're clear. He oh, really? He, he he designed the shirt? He did everything. He's the one who hooked up with Carrie and all these guys because of yeah. Paul Blues back in the day. He had tattoos from him. This is how I hooked up with him. Amazing guy. Again, one of the biggest losses that I had in the last few years. He died, I think, almost... A year ago, uh, like a month ago. I'll never forget his reaction. He went to the show and he contacted me right after and he goes, let me tell you something, dude. And again, Jack was not a black metal guy, just just so we're clear. Jack was DSI, Slayer, Slayer, and more Slayer. This was his level, right? Uh, And that guy had more knowledge. He's also a huge shirt collector mm. uh more knowledge than i would ever even have if i tried and he went to the show and i'll never forget me he called me right after because unlike me he was sober and he goes let me tell you something what they do their thing and it's a black metal for black metal's sake and i knew that in four minutes 20 seconds he's going to bring the chalice and yep. in five minutes 35 seconds, he's going to do the fire. And look, dude, I love that. And I think the Watang guys are amazing. Don't get me wrong, on a personal level, on a musical level. As a black metal guy, we talked about this before. I give them 100% props on what they're doing. With that being said, he goes, dude, Mayhem went on stage. No makeup. Yannick over this fucking man, man. Uh, one guy put a hoodie on to kind of be cool. And he was like, fuck me. He was just so blown away, again, on face value of how intense the music was. He used to play guitar, too, so he could understand a lot of shit that I don't. And he was like, I don't even know what to tell you. He was just yeah. blown the fuck away and he goes here is two bands that are considered very pioneering in their own rights and he was like i could see right there in my own eyes why mayhem is mayhem and they can go up there in their fucking onesies or pajamas <laughs> where what <laughs> tape yeah. needs real pig blood to maintain their shit yeah 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 and you- i agree with him it's, 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 it's no argument you know it's just like yeah dude i, I I see what he was seeing. And again, he's one of those people that his views to me were very much like me and you being 12. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was very straight up forward and he'll be the first guy to admit, he'll be the first guy going to Gary Old or Carrie and be like, oh, that show was not. Maybe I sat down with him 
Mm. It was Maryland Death Fest and down the headline. And again, we both know the guys and da da da, and nothing to do with it. And he goes, Oh, that's that part that down brings everybody on stage and pretends like, Oh, this is the part where you guys come out. And he knew how it went because he's seen them enough times. And I was like, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> like this is the ten minutes forty five seconds, which is the part that he throws the mic away. But it's so, you know, when you do go, I guess again for people like him, especially that they really followed those bands and went to so many music festivals and shit throughout their whole life. Was a few years older than me. You realize eventually exactly what you said. You realize eventually that you're like, you know what, dude. If you follow a band, um, I keep saying it's kind of like the Grateful Dead scenario. If you follow yeah. a band to that extent, it becomes old a little too quick. No matter how much you like their music, you're like, uh, your whole gig is almost like the guy from the corner. is like, this is the time where you're supposed to pretend like you're fainting or whatever, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, very... So, I, you know, and, and like you said, with Watain... Uh, I have a guy that I know from the state, this Romanian guy, same thing, he's a photographer, super passionate guy, especially about black metal for his whole life. And he reminded me this few years ago, and I remember it too, the first time both of us saw Watain, the first time Watain toured in the US, I believe it was 2007, pretty sure it was 2007. <laughs> And both of us got completely shit faced. And I remember it because not only did he remind me, a few songs into it, I looked at him, he looked at me, and I go, This is what black, this is what I would expect to be a black metal show. And he was like, Yes, like a hundred percent. So on that level. Again, I give them 100% respect. But for the people, for the Wolfpack, for the whole nine yard, the people that follow them, it's like, did, did you not, seriously? Do you not realize by now that this is kind of like a little, a well, little tackier? I, I, think, I think the way that you just described it earlier was, was probably the most perfect analogy I've ever heard. There are bands that do, you know, whatever their style, whatever it is they're into, they do it for... Um, you know, they do, you know, black metal for black metal's sake or they do, you know, death metal for death metal's sake. And then there's guys that do it because it literally comes from the fucking, you know, very pit of their stomachs, you know, and, and Mayhem is a great example of that. My girlfriend's not into metal whatsoever. She went with me to the Incineration Fest last year and she saw Mayhem and she even she was blown away. It's like you, you cannot see that band and not be fucking stunned. And it's like, you know... Trying to think of uh, of other examples. I mean, even in the you know in the in the hardcore scene, I've seen tons of hardcore bands. But if you saw Biohazard in the in the old days with the original oh, lineup, you saw oh, on stage. It literally it felt like there was going to be a fucking riot breaking out at yes, any point. Sir. You know, and that's Biohazard that's definitely- used to get off stage even a fucking dominating thing because they didn't let people on stage. And they're like, <laughs> they're not on stage. We're not on stage. Yeah. I saw Biohazard in Israel. They're a bunch of Jew boys, most of them. So they were super stoked about coming to Israel. I believe it was probably a second album. I think they came to Israel. It must have been, I would say, 94 or something like that. Yeah, it would have been Urban Discipline or a State of the Urban Discipline, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Um, I was apprenticing to Tattoo, and the guy I was apprenticing under, we had a good friend in Israel that brought all the bands back then, so he brought Biohazard. So uh, Bobby came and got tattooed by the guy I apprenticed under. Okay. Evan talked, because Evan is Evan. Oh, I want to get tattooed in Israel. Da, 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 da. And obviously, he never did. Regardless, I met the guys backstage. I went to see Biohazard. Dude, it was... Yeah, Biohazard back then were like, it was not hardcore as they used to be claimed to be. And Evan Seinfeld is also not from Brooklyn, even though it's tattooed all over his stomach. <laughs> that yeah. fucking island. Yeah, yeah. Regardless, yes, those bands used to mean so much more and have so much impact back then. 
And again, to see them in a place like, was it Reading back then or Donington? They were like the biggest of the biggest festivals back then. This is pre ozfest This is mm. pre any of that shit. Those were the biggest metal festivals in the world, especially for me in Israel. The ones in England were like the one, the one we knew about. And I was actually pissed off when I moved to the States in 97 because I went to Ozfest. I think I told you that before. I went to Ozfest in 97. Cool. It's the Aussie and Black Sabbath. And there was a lineup from hell, I think. Soulfly, a lot of bands that I was like, fuck yeah, right? Then I see the same Ozfest going to Europe with Slayer and Pantera and like all sorts of extra shit that I'm like, fuck you. I'm in the US and seriously. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, those festivals were known for what it was. I think they still are for some of us that are a little older. We're still like, oh man, this will be a festival to go to just for good old sake, good old day's sake. I would never forget, dude. Fucking Biohazard tour back then, what? Like fucking 40 shows in 30 days or some insane yeah, thing Yeah, like it, 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 it was not. I, mean, they, I was about to say, they were like, you know, as far as road dogs were concerned, they were, you know, at the top of the of, at the top it of the heap this, as far as guys that were always playing. Those guys, like, again, those guys stood on stage in front of like 50,000 people and literally stopped the show going like, hold on, guards. If those 300 people can't be on stage with us, we're not going to be on stage either. And it, look, a few years later, I lived in New York. CBGB has always been like that. Okay. CBGB stage is made for people to go on it. This yeah. is how it's built. And I've seen my friends from Jimmy Gestapo, the fucking... Uh, you know, Gnostic Front and all those guys, like, they still do the same shit. Sick of it all. New York Hardcore is still the same shit. Biohazard, uh, Life of Agony, all those bands that came from that scene maintained that. And, again, as uh, I'll be the first one to admit it, and as juvenile as it is, which, again, I'm proud to be one, yes, that meant the world to us. That's back when we didn't care. You can be Metallica, but if you did that move in a show, just like Acid Bath happened to Gacy Painting, I was sold. I was yeah. like, you're the real deal, motherfucker, and I don't care what comes after or before or whatever it is. You just sold me your whole attitude part of it. Which I think a lot of people, it's just a different world now. And that's what I mean by like, I saw the other day something, they broke down how Pantera did it and how other bands did it. And they were very basic and very true to the fact that like Pantera was the tough guy that even if you weren't, you wanted to be. You know what I mean? He yeah, was yeah, yeah. shit like, walk on home, boy. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, he was yeah. screaming shit that you're like, I wish I could scream that to some fucking asshole down the street. <laughs> yeah. But he was that guy, and they were those people. And yes, that's what sold us the whole thing. And dude, I'm having this thing with my wife daily. We're having this conversation. She's a metalhead. But she makes fun of me for that. And I'm like, you really don't get it. She's like, oh, what? I'm not cool enough. I'm like, it's nothing to do with cool. It's actually juvenile. But no, you apparently don't get it. Because, I don't know if it's because you don't have balls or because you didn't grow up in Israel and grew up in Scandinavia. I really don't know what it is. But for you, for me, for other people, yeah, dude, that was the selling point. There dude, was no... Massively. I, I, I talk to people about this uh, a lot, you know, and I've probably not spoken about it on the show as much. But, I mean, you know, I... I went through a couple of years in, in, in school of, of, you know, having to deal with a lot of bullies and a lot of bullshit. And Pantera nursed me through all of that. But they didn't nurse me through it in the way that, um, you know, it, when I felt sad, they they made me feel comforted. Hearing Full Anselmo made me want to fuck people up. So, yeah. so like, you know, you could you could listen to a new level when you hear him like yelling at the, you know, just after the, the breakdown, I was like, no fucking surrender. It's like, you know, that, that doesn't just, that doesn't make you feel, um, it doesn't make you feel like someone understands my pain. It makes you feel empowered. That's the thing that I think that's a, that's one of the biggest appeals it of Pantera you to young. Like the bully that you weren't. Exactly. This is the beauty of it. It it, it I think the I think the thing that that um, 
and I, and I, I'm not, I don't mean to be sexist or anything like this to any women listening, but I think that that a lot of women don't necessarily get about Pantera and and, and why men of a certain age were so attracted to Pantera. It was empowering, hundred yeah. yeah. percent. Same as same as Bio has it. Like if you listen to that Urban Discipline album, I mean, you, there could be five guys bearing down on you, but you know, before you before you took an ass whooping, you were probably going to take a couple of those guys down. Yes, and. Look, dude, I'll be the last, I'll be the first one to admit, dude. I grew up in Israel, for fuck's sake. I'm an Israeli guy. I'm, I'm like, I might be American for many years, and da, da. yeah, I'm a fucking guy from Israel, dude. It's a fucking place built on exactly that. Yeah. The macho, the Middle East, the war zone, the whole like. But I wasn't one that's going around like. I mean, yeah, I got into my fights and shit like we all did. I wasn't the bully. I wasn't that guy. But I was walking around in my home home, punching my own walls, screaming exactly that. It's like, fuck you. And I fucking, you know, like my punching bag was Pantera. It was yeah. really. Yeah. And again, till this very day, you know, I get, I, I was like, I thought we moved to Denmark a few months ago. I have a little house here and shit, at least for now, which is a whole different ball game for me. I remember my wife came out the other day. I'm working on my art here now. This whole quarantine and shit. So I can't tattoo. So I'm making art, which again, I'm very thankful to people supporting me. She's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what, what do you mean? She's like, you're walking around the backyard in circles, marching around your little table, the drawing with a cigarette in your mouth, screaming completely off beat, <laughs> shit to the air. She's like, you have no rhythm. And I was like, I'm listening to Pantera again and put fucking proof on that one. Yeah. <laughs> and it was exactly that. I was like, till this very day, Pantera, Slayer, there's a bunch of other bands. I put this shit on and dude, I can, I wanted to draw to it. I was not doing much drawing. I was yeah. doing much more marching around the table with the drawing, like a dum dum, going like, "Where well, I want to punch something, like I want to punch something now." <laughs> yeah, and it's no, still, I... this is what I mean by face value. Look, dude, it it makes my heart and my blood fucking boil. Yeah, till yeah, this yeah. very day. And again, I don't care how PC we are and how the world works nowadays. Sorry, ladies. Yes, that's a part of being a guy and being a fucking macho, whether I care to admit yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. act on it in real life. I don't smack my bitch up. But fuck me if I don't listen to fucking Bill screaming and walking down there like a kid trying to punch anything that comes yeah. in his way. Don't care. And you know what? Not for nothing. Pantera has one line. And the reason I remember even more clearly is that somebody spray painted it in the bathroom of my fucking high school. That's the beauty of Pantera and everybody says he's this, he's that, whatever. Pantera has a line that says one thing. No matter what color, you wouldn't be saved from hell. And this is <laughs> the epitome for me of their yeah. anger. This was not because you're black or you're white or you're Jewish or whatever the fuck you are. They wanted to kill you all. Mm. They wanted to punch you all. And that's what they transcend. That's what they, they kind of like put out there. And like you said, I'm sorry. It's not even age or genre or generation. We're guys. We're, we're, yeah. we're kind of like, this is just look at the animal world. This is just how yeah, a natural yeah. thing that comes across, whether we as people try not to express it because we know it's not okay. But fuck yeah, you put that shit out there and our blood start to go like, oh. Yeah, there's a, there's a very primal appeal to it. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I was in the same boat as you. I mean, I, I got into a, a fuckload of fights when I was at, at school and I didn't start a single one. I've never been, never in my entire life have I actually gone up to somebody and actually physically picked a fight with them. But, you know, 
probably fueled in part by bands like Pantera and Slayer. I never ever backed down from any either. I, I you know, yep. I took my I took my licks because I was I was quite a, a stroppy motherfucker. But I, you know, if if someone started on me, you know, all I would hear in my the back of my head is like, "My demons be driven," <laughs> you know. And then you you, you know, and, and if it were not for those bands, I kind of I sort of wonder how life would have turned out because I, I genuinely I. I I attach that level of importance to their influence in my life. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it, and that's what I mean. You know, I keep laughing at it now because a where the world is gone. Same way I told you that, like, you know, it's a lot of bands I listen to, and, and I can have my opinion and I can have shit and things come and go. You know, same thing like I told with Danzig that, like, dude, you listen to Danzig now, you're a fucking emo. Where well, we listened to Denzig, it was just another version of metal. Yeah. Um, to put that in perspective, I just started a fucking uh, leg sleeve on a guy in New York, which is all music. First thing we did on it was actually Denzig and the Denzig logo. Okay. And it was a mix of Denzig portrait with the Misfits uh, skull, whatever you call it in Misfits yeah. world. Um, and I was like, you know what? We're doing this. I'm putting Denzig on. So I went on YouTube and I put fucking Lucifuge, which is my favorite Denzig album. And let me tell you, I was sitting there going, like, rocking out like a fucking juvenile kid going like, fuck yeah, dude, this still rocks. I fuck don't care yes. what you call it now. I don't care what he did after with his kitties and how fucked up his attitude or whatever. On a face value, on what that music means to me what it represents to me and again even with Danzig it wasn't the anger it was his voice it was the deepness of his voice like Elvis it was mm. just little things that play into it beyond you know the musical part of it or whatever yes Pantera Slayer I, I don't think people understand that now because they really judge it a lot of them judge it on the value of it musically mm. nowadays more than anything where like i said i i uh same thing i've had that discussion with my wife the other day which is the only person i can talk to since we're caught up at home here uh, and i've had that same discussion with her on on, on the same level because she would hear shit from my computer on my phone and she's like the fuck is this because it sounds terrible when you're not around it and I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? This is like Slayer or whatever. She's like, it sounds horrible. And I was like, it's not. It's really not. It, it's, it plays on different levels mm. from my emotions to other shit. Um, same way like my friend Jack that I told you about. I'll never forget one of the first times Jack stayed with me. I was still living in Astoria, Queens. It was probably early 2000s. Living with my cousin. And my cousin comes out to the living room. He's like, what the fuck are you guys doing? Dude, it was probably like way past midnight. And we just put on D side. And the two of us were like running around having our little mosh pit in my living room, screaming like, that my dog, that my dog. <laughs> and it's just like, and I, I, again, the older I got, like I told you, weirdly enough, I'm regressing all the way from going back to fucking drinking my Jack Daniels to listening to that shit. I can't argue with the way it makes me feel. I can't argue with the fact that it makes my heart beat. It makes me, I'm not still not going to go out and pick up a fight, but I might go and punch a fucking wall because mm -hmm. this is just how it makes me feel. And just like you said, with no disrespect to anyone, because I'm sure there's a lot of girls out there that can kick my ass, as a macho thing to it, it's like, yeah. Yeah, oh, I don't feel bad about being angry or punching walls. You know, yeah. I don't feel like an idiot about it, as opposed to other people who be like, oh, what am I doing? I'm like, I'm doing something very natural. I'm doing something very primal. Yeah. And this is what that music brings out at least for me, you know, yeah. it's like, I, I'm not going to be one to argue with it. I'm like, you know, I love it for what it is. And like you said, even Phil Anselmo, just hearing his voice, just hearing the specific things. They did it to me when I was fucking 11 years old and they still do it to me now when I'm 43 years old. Yeah, yeah. And 
I, 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 you, you mentioned Danzig, and I, I do think that he's a, he's quite a misunderstood character, at least from my experience of him, because I, I interviewed him probably about ten years ago, and pre- preceding the interview, I'd spoken to a bunch of different people, um, you know, just as we, we always used to when I was, when I was writing for, um, you know, for Chronicles of Chaos. And you are, you know, you you sort of, you know, go around the room and you start talking shit about people you've met and things like that. It's like, you know, and and I, w- the conversation once came on to, you know, who was the worst guy you ever interviewed? And I mean, fucking unanimously across the room, it's like Danzig, biggest asshole ever. <laughs> One guy apparently he just stood up midway during the interview and he left the room. <laughs> Another guy who just refused to answer any questions. <laughs> And then, uh, so I was a bit nervous about interviewing him, and uh, they, I interviewed him when uh, when Circle of Snakes came out. And he and I ended up talking probably for about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, so much so that Regain Records, who put that album out, actually called me up the next day, out of the blue, and said, um, "Glenn had just asked them to uh, to give me a ring and say thank you very much for a, for a great interview." And I was, I mean, it stuck by me to this day because I always feel like I feel like Glenn gets a bad rap, but I'm in a I'm a massive Danzig fan anyway, but I think with him, I think part of why he can be so hostile and, and, you know, come across maybe as a bit arrogant or obnoxious is I just think he's tired of being, if you think about how long that guy has been around for, he's Here's tired of thing. being asked the same old shit from people. Here's what I think about Danzig. I only got to meet him once. I, I saw him a bunch. I actually saw him when he did, what was it, like 20 or 30 year anniversary tour. Yeah. Let me tell you, I was disappointed. I was really disappointed. Really? Because of one fact, he went on stage and he did the dancing thing. He did nothing special. And I'm like, you know what, dude, this is, it's an anniversary thing. I was hoping he would do something. He did the thing and Doyle came and did a few songs with him. You know, the whole, again, like we talked about Watain or some other band, the whole nine yard of what I heard dancing is, right? I got to meet him once in Florida in a comic shop. Um, I have two science comics by him. I have Veronica. And probably Death Dealer, signed by him and everything. I kept it very minimal, the same way when I met H.R. Giger. Look, I'm a huge Danzig fan since I was a kid, okay? And the thing for me, at least personally, many years ago that put that nail on the coffin on the Danzig, the talented motherfucker, was Black Aria. Mm. I think we talked about that before, too. And that's the level of some other bands, like I told you, when when a metal band, even like Phil and Selma, do it, fucking Cemetery Gate. It, 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 especially for artists such as myself, uh, not to compare it to any of those guys, don't get me wrong, but, you know, and more eccentric artists or more darker artists, when an artist like me do something, you know, I'll give you something better. When Paul Booth did a back piece back in the day of just like, animals and the way they summed it up in a magazine back then was kind of like they didn't put it as a fuck you but they're like here's a showcase to just show you how good this guy is he chooses to do evil shit don't mm-hmm. think that's just all he can do same way i felt about denzig same way i felt about um again about uh pantera doing cemetery gates and shit to be like phil can sing yeah don't think i can only scream right be honest with you, what I got from Danzig and what I understood because uh, Bobby Steele, the original guitar player for Misfits, used to live upstairs from the original Last Rides on 4th Street between A and B and East Village in New York when I worked there. So we used to see him almost daily. He's one of the only people I ever met in my life other than, uh, sadly, uh, fuck, I forgot his name, the guy who just died from uh, Trash and Bobville in New York. One of the only people who really was truly still punk was Bobby Steele, okay? Mm-hmm. Bobby Steele was the New York connection of, um, I'm getting too drunk now, of Sex Pistols, of Sid yeah. Vicious. Bobby Steele was Sid Vicious' best friend, okay? This is how punk rock we're talking about, okay? And Bobby told him, and Bobby hated Denzel, okay? They had been suing each other for years about rights. And Bobby explained to me something very simple. And he goes, do you know why Glenn became so even buff the way he is? And so attitude because the way he is. Because apparently, or according to him, if I remember correct, back in the day when Misfits existed, he was such a fucking 
pussy ass, tiny guy, super skinny in a punk scene, in the real punk scene. We're talking 70s CBGB. Mm -hmm. That means that most people in the crowd used to come up and spit in his mouth and punch him in the face because that's what both punk used to be. And this kind of explained to me in a way why he became a so standoffish, B so you yeah, know, yeah, it's yeah. not just a Napoleon um complex type of deal. From what I understood, um, the same way they said about a lot of serial killers and other shit, dude. They're, they're, if you read his biography, that guy became who he became for very specific reasons. Mm. And again, in my opinion, at least, and as somebody that yes, I was always a Danzig fan. I got to hand it to the guy at the end of the day. Beyond the bullshit, beyond whatever you want to put, beyond all the memes of him with his cats, he's still mm -hmm. glad fucking dancing, dude. Yeah. You cannot deny him, and you cannot deny what he made out of himself. If only for the fact that, again, we both know how many bands are like, oh, wow, those guys are amazing. And then when they break up, maybe one of them is still amazing. And the rest of them were kind of like, hey, what happened to that guy? Like, I guess he wasn't that amazing. I guess yeah, he yeah, did yeah. It the other guys. Danzig didn't. Danzig did fucking Misfits. Yeah. Sam Hain and fucking Danzig, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he keeps going. Yeah, you know, speaking of, again, like, I know I'm rambling. When I was in New York uh, for many years, uh, I still did it even in Berlin and other places. I'm always a big fan, I told you that, of going on a personal level, metal shows and other shit to promote tattoo studios and everything, putting my flyers, giving flyers to people to really show people more than anything to do. I'm the real deal. I'm, not, I'm a part of you guys. I'm not really, you know, I became more famous. Last day, who gives a fuck? You know, I'm just one of you. Sam Hain played in New York, and I, I was fortunate enough to see them before, so I was okay with it. My wife just moved to New York, and I was sick as a fucking dog. And they played in Times Square, and uh, I can't remember which venue, big venue, like 5,000 people. I just opened in front of them, and I'm like, fuck, I really need to go get flyers. And she's like, you're sick, dude, don't, I'll do it. I'm like, all right, cool, thank you. So she went. One thing led to another thing got postponed, da da da, whatever. The show it was raining outside, so she paid $30 and she went into the show. I will never forget, dude. It's Sam Hain we're talking about. It's a very quiet taste. Yeah. I will never forget. For two days, she came home and she's like, What the fuck did I just see? This is the biggest shit I've ever seen in my life. And I was like, <laughs> I'm like, you need to be a Misfits fan and a Danzig fan to understand the Misfits is exactly... I, I was just about to say, you, you kind of need to be a fan of those bands first and then you can graduate up to Sam Hain eventually. Because I, I actually, nowadays, some of my favorite Glenn stuff is actually Sam Hain albums, but... I, I, what, there, there's what, some... what that album is called? It was uh, forever you couldn't get it. The world that... Uh... Initium. The one no, where they covered in fire. blood on the front. Uh, no, no, November Coming Fire. November Coming Fire. I remember as a kid, that album was like, you got to go to England and maybe for 300 pounds, somebody will sell you a song. It was a no, for years, you couldn't get that yeah. album. It was just, and that is the Semrin album, which again, it's dancing songs that sounds exactly halfway through Misfits and Danzig. So yeah, if you like yeah. the two, you're like, oh, wow, that's a nice mix. But she's she likes metal, but very specific. Mm. She didn't know what I'm talking about. So when she ended up, she wasn't supposed to see the show. She was supposed to go and now fly her. She ended up seeing the show and she's like, what did I just suffer through? And I was like, oh yeah, this is King Diamond style. This is a very acquired taste. <laughs> yeah. that if you don't like it, you're literally going to feel like you're in a hostel being tortured. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but you know, yeah, it, I, I think though as well. There's, there's sometimes you just catch dudes on a bad day. You know, you, you I've had to sort of you know write things off like that as well. You know, Gaul's a good example. I've I've told the story before. I 
the, he was the he was the one and only truly bad interview I ever did, where the interview was done after 15 minutes, and I had probably about 20 minutes worth of questions prepped. So excited about it because it was just as uh, Ad Majorum, Satanas Glorium came out, you know, an album which I loved, um, you know, and I was like, fuck yes, I'm interviewing Gall. And after like 15 minutes, it's like this interview is going nowhere. I, I can just as well cut the step. You know, just, I can, you can uh, have you seen Gall's weird on fucking on on tour? I've not seen them live. I, I missed them because I, I'd seen Mayhem in uh, June and then in uh, when they were here in November uh, last year with Carlsbeard. I um, I can't remember why I didn't go. I, there was, I, yes. I think I was Make traveling. a point to go see them. And, yeah. and, and again, I'm not, like I told you, I'm, I'm really still blown away that the whole band is actually my friends. Um, I'm a huge fan of what they did with Carlsbeard. I mean, I'm me telling too. you this because of one reason. Gallbeard show now. It's about four or five songs from Gallbeard, three, four songs of fucking Gorgoroth with him singing. Awesome. Yes. Well, you so know that uh... turn around, go see them. It's like I think he does two other songs from uh, either Troll Dime or uh, some other project. Yeah. But he does about half of their show is Gorgoroth. And let me tell you, it, it's. Yes, like you should do that for yeah, yourself. No, no, I, I, I definitely want to see that. I did see them live with as Gorgoroth with him, and that was awesome. But um, I, yeah, uh, I wish. And the thing is, I, 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 I've spoken to Jessica at Season of Mist, and I, I would love to, to, to speak to him again because I think he's probably quite a different dude now to what he was then as well. You know, again, like I, I, yeah. I get it. That was two thousand and I think two thousand six, two thousand seven. It was right around the time that all the controversy was there around the show that you know they've been banned in Poland and stuff I'm sure he was he was probably at the end of tired at the end of the day you know having had about 500 different questions all you know amounting to the same thing so how does it feel to be persecuted for your religious beliefs and it was, yeah. yeah so I, I I I get why he would have felt like this I think actually being on a show like this would be more interesting because there's a bunch of shit we can talk about wine you know, black metal. <laughs> he's odd. He's, you know. it, it, it's you know, it, it's it, it, yeah. He's like I told you, he's, he's definitely a character. I, I've never met him back then, um, so I, I really don't know. And knowing him now, it's almost weirder for me to even think how he would have been back then. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like he is such a different person than Gorgoroth Gall. But again, with this, with Galscog, with, with so many projects that he did by now, it, he just seems to me a one of those that he, he's really not trying. Like, you know, he, he was like, he was even telling me, like, the, the mayor of fucking Bergen, when he sees him, he's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> yeah. He's to that level, you know what I mean? That everybody knows who he is and blah, blah, blah. And then, no, he's just like Christian. Uh, Christian Espinal, yeah, whatever. But no, he's still, you know, that, that like, again, with that scariest man in Norway, or he, most evil man in Norway interview yeah. with the bystander that, that stared oh, at the Oh, fuck. End. And then right, yeah, right, right at the end, all he does is like, you're not asking the right questions, and then just... That sums him up. That's really, you end. know, because, like I told you, a lot of those guys that I call my friends now, they could be the nicest people in the world. But the deeper friends you are with them, you realize that may you never see the other side of those people. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they have something in there, and it, 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 it's the same way. Like you, like I said, that people told me before, like, "Oh, you're such a nice guy," blah blah blah. And I'm like, "Okay, you should think about me as a nice guy. And think about what I do, and you go home with that feeling." And uh, you know, remember Ted Bundy, and let me know how you feel about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that's, in my opinion, it's actually yeah. even bigger beauty to kind of like leave it at that, which is, you know, I, I I can never remember who the fuck said it before. I think there was like either Alfred Hitchcock or one of those directors back in the day that said, I can scare you a lot more by what I'm not showing you what's in yeah. your head than me putting shit in your face and being like, ah, you know, like the whole scare tactic of it yeah but yeah no i i honestly no, I, i've never met him back then i've never met a lot of those people back then and like the rest of us yeah we go through one point or not in our life you know that we are who we are and 
entertainment is entertainment. So I take everything with a grain of salt or what came out of his mouth in one interview or another or however the fucking editor put I it I mean, there, you know, know, some of that shit as well, I think was just trolling. It's like Glenn Benton in the old days, man. I mean, you remember like the old, uh, yeah. there was there was this old documentary that came out uh, called Dancing with the Devil. And then they interviewed Glenn, um, you know, back before he even had a beard and it was like right yeah. after uh, Amon came out and the guy asks him, do you believe in demonic possession? Of course. Are you demonically possessed? Of course. <laughs> like, I, you know, I remember Benton just saying, what was it? One of my favorite things as a kid when he used to say that his favorite thing, because he used to get uh, Inverter Cross redone. Because yeah. back then people really didn't know how to do those things properly. I don't even know who the fuck it is. But I remember he was saying that his favorite thing is to go in the mall or somewhere and look at like old ladies or whatever while he's still like oozing from him <laughs> right across. <laughs> oh, and like it was just being done by the devil or, and it was the satanic scare. There was so much to it. Um, but it's the same way again, it, what was it? There's a couple of things like that on YouTube about uh, Wikipedia. Yeah. I think it was like Loudwire that did it or something. It was a guy who interviews all these guys. And he asked, I think, who was it? Uh, it was like uh, Tom or I or somebody. When he asked him flat out about the whole satanic thing and da da da, and did you really believe in a Satan or was it really like a gig thing? And he was like, dude, you seriously asking me this? I'm like, of course, it was a fucking show thing. And like, yeah, yeah. I, I've been. I've toured around the world and met enough people that are kind of disappointed that I don't eat a baby in the morning and I don't really worship Satan with them. And they're like, so you're not the real deal. And I'm like, dude, if you really believe in Satan, you might as well go back to church. Like, I don't really know what else to tell you. Yeah. But it is what it is. And again, those people have that stuff in them. We all do. There's a reason why we are attracted to that stuff or why we talked about this before you can hear the melody or not behind it it's as yeah. simple as that and it's not for everybody and you know my, my first wife in florida which was actually semi-religious i'll never forget i came home one day i think that's when diablo de musica was out and she looked at me and she like yeah we've been together for a while now and i'm like why are you saying that? And she's like, because I find myself at home screaming Antichrist in the name of God <laughs> while she's looking at other, you know, she was a traditional artist doing like religious fucking iconography. And she was like, yeah, no. And I'm like, look, it, it, it is what it is. And it's like you said, we're a little older to understand. I'm like, dude, I don't need to burn a church to make my fucking point, which I thought now will be a good time. But apparently those, apparently yeah. the only people that still go gather around now are religious fuckers, yeah, Christian or Jewish. Um, so I guess this is not a good time. But yeah, it, it's it is what it is, you know. You take it for what it is, and whoever you are, whatever you are, you know how you feel about it or whatever. And it's like, yeah. if you're gonna worship one thing that that same fucking idiots fucking made up, then dude, you're really missing the point. I know you've just done a, or, or a couple of months ago, you'd, you'd done an album cover for a band called uh, Maniac Rise. I mean, with, that was a while back, actually, but go on. Yeah, but all, with all the people that you know, and and just especially recently, some of the stuff that you've been posting on online, like that that new charcoal drawing that you posted today, um, is absolutely incredible. Like, how come you don't do more okay. album covers? Like, oh, do, do people ask you about that, or is it something that you you've ever kind of thought to sort of? I Look, guess I don't know how you could put your name out there, but you know what I mean. You know, is it is it something that you 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 could kind of extend your art form into something like that? I always tried and still do to push my stuff 
any of it on friends of mine from Mayhem to Slayer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kerry King has my painting in his house, whatever, his other shit, you know, same thing with Jan Axel, same thing with uh, Toque and shit. They all have my art, you know, uh, Dark Funeral and shit. They were all like, yes or no, because they have their own ideas or imagery or whatever, which I just don't fit. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is what it is, you know. And like I told you, on my personal level, I don't give a fuck, dude. If you appreciate my art and you're one of my heroes or idols, whatever you want to call them, I'm, I'm already like, okay, we're dying tomorrow. That, that's no problem there. Um, a lot of those things has to do with what they're into, what they think represent them better. There's a guy, I cannot pronounce his name. I think it's Daniele or Daniele Valerini from Roma, I believe. And he's been doing art for all the bands now. From Behemoth, the last Damon album, you know, you name it. And I can understand why. I don't know the fact that he's super talented, never met him personally yet. Um, he fits that thing, he fits the imagery because it's not only dark, but it also looks like wood carvings and it looks mm. a little more esoteric. Um, I don't have it in me. It's really, it's a different style to it. And it is what it is. Maniac Rise was a few years ago. They they they, they stopped actually doing it now. Um, I did both their albums, actually. They did their first and their second album. Maniac Rise is a good friend of mine called Rob. Rob Castoria, Big Rob from New York. That motherfucker can play guitar that it's painful to fucking hear how good he is. Mm. And Maniac Rise were stuff that he actually wrote many, many years ago. Speaking of, uh, the band eventually broke down. Another guy I played with him is a good friend of mine, uh, Dave Sussman, that's from Bile and other bands, is a bass player. Um, what Big Rob does now, he's actually the guitar player with Marauder. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, for a couple of years. So I'm like, fuck it. I, I, Sadly, I'm not wearing it. I got a bunch of Marauder. Dude, I've heard about Marauder since I moved to New York. And now I finally got to meet the guys and see them and everything with it. And I'm like, whoa, since you have Marauder now. And he's like, yeah, we're talking about maybe having you make a shirt. I'm like, fuck yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. But they have their people. They yeah. have their friends. They have people that they've been working with the same way with uh, Ariman from Dark Funeral. Uh, we, I was working with him for a while. Same thing. That guy's amazing, dude. He's been supporting me for many years. I've been tattooing him. But the style of the art that does for Dark Funeral is still the original artist. You know, they stick to stuff that they like, that they like for that stuff. Um, I'm down for the cause any day. You know, that, that's really a no-brainer whatsoever. I've tried to work with a few bands on different stuff. I've done merchandise. I've done whatever. A lot of it has to do with who do you know? Yeah. And does it work? And again, even in my case, I can be best friends with one, two, three. But if the other two guys in the band are like, eh, we want this. And that's where they go. You know what I yeah. mean? yeah, yeah. And again, I, I like it for what it is. I can understand it for what it is. I would love to do that for them. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I have friends like uh, Bob Tyrell, tattoo artist. He did a lot of stuff for Exodus because he's really good friends with Exodus. He's yeah, from yeah. there. Shit like that. Um, the same way that Paul Booth did stuff for Slayer eventually. Eventually. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it I was took a say lot that. of even, red lines. You know, that. even he took a while to sort of break into that. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you can talk about this or not, but I remember you telling me a story about um, way back about how before Miami Inc. actually happened, uh, the original uh -huh. idea for that show was going to be in Last Rites. Yeah. And so, yeah. so how come how come nothing came of it? Did they, <laughs> did uh, they see you well, pack their shit and leave? Or first of all, on my personal level, thanks. Fucking Satan, that never happened. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How come, you know, I know what I know from what Paul told me, what other shit that I heard. With that being said, 
Brother, I'm not going to lie to you. I think everything comes out of everybody's mouth nowadays, even my best friend with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. That's just the world and reality that we live in. And even if they do truly believe that that's what happened, uh, you know, if you ever took acid, you would understand that what you see, what you, what you see is what you get is also yeah. an illusion. Okay. So yeah. what you believe is what happened. It is what it is. What happened with that was, according to Paul, at least, <coughs> Paul came out with the idea. I remember that. I clearly remember that. I, I, I'm trying not to get too fucking political here on one thing or another, one way or another. Look, again, I got to Paul Booth for very specific reasons, for people like us and what he represented and everything else. I, I kind of question my own shit and his own integrity at this point of like the fact that he has a big studio and a fucking thing in Times Square and like uh, maybe it was about money more than about whatever he believed. Yeah. Regardless. He did come up with the idea. I remember that. And I remember clearly why, because we did not have cable TV for many years. We, I still don't. I believe he probably doesn't either. But it is what it is. We would fly places around the world and we would have the little TV in front of us, especially I think it was EasyJet, one of those companies that had TV on their shit. So we would see shit when reality TV became and it was so dumb. Yeah, yeah. As dumb as being on an airplane and seeing a reality TV saying like in the airport and we're like, what? Why the fuck would anybody want to see this? So his take of this and him being Paul Booth and knowing all these celebrities and having a niche more than anything and being one of the originators of celebrity tattoo artists, which the originator was actually Lyle Tuttle, the tattoo Janis Joplin. Um, Paul being who he was and what he was, and again, same thing, was like, huh, if they're doing this in reality TV, there's no reality TV about tattoo. You got tattooed, you know the drill. You go to a tattoo studio that operates, especially with a few artists, especially a well-oiled machine, it's an experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the jokes, to the pain, to the whole nine yard of it, the artistic part, of it, whatever you want to break it down to, it's a fucking experience. And of course, a lot of people would be interested in it the same way that your girlfriend or your wife, like you said, not being interested in metal is still interested to come see with you what's the deal all about. Mm. That's what reality TV is all about, right? So with that being said, um, we had, again, he was tattooing all these celebrities, MTV, da, da, da. He had his connection. He sat down and wrote this whole thing about... The Apprentice, which I was, the, the crew, the one guy they went in front of, the one guy that was like, oh, this guy don't really belong here. All the little shit he thought about. And he pitched it because we had a few people, whether they're sponsors or helping to do the conventions and other stuff. He pitched it to them. Um, MTV right away said, yes, fuck yes, absolutely, we want this. We didn't want to go on MTV because... We're metalheads. That's mm -hmm. the last place you want to go. So we waited, waited, waited. TLC, this, that, da, da, da. They all said, eh, not really. And what they all really wanted was the bimbo in the chair getting a tram stamp. That, yeah. That's right. Because, again, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm any better than any of those people. This is what sells. Me and you both know this, and everybody is ever going to listen to this both know this this is not me being any above anything this yeah, is yeah. just how the world operates you know again why we don't have tv um so that happened mtv kept coming knocking on our door They're like no we really want this eventually we went with mtv one of the sponsors that represented us was the guy who was the original guy who supported and started i think it was american chopper or a couple of the bigger shows back then yeah so he had a weight behind him too. And MTV kept knocking and knocking. Then eventually we're like, MTV it is. So MTV put half a million dollars back then and came and shot in the studio for two months straight, a 25-minute pilot, um, and made it. Uh, it was horrendous. 
for me at least. Yeah. It was so not last Friday. It was so not ooh, you're dark. They really played on the whole part of his daughter coming to town to work with her dad, which she didn't back then. There was a whole family aspect again, like American Chopper. Yeah, yeah. And I can't repeat this enough. I'm not above this, but sorry, people. I'm a juvenile fucking metalhead. Fuck you and your reality TV. That's how I felt about it back then. That's how I feel about it back now. The only two people still didn't really support it was me and Sarah, which was his girlfriend at the time, still one of my best friends. Um, they put half a million dollars. We went through all the red tapes. We got approved. This was way before there was any reality tattoo show TV on yet. And I can't remember what exactly was the process or how exactly it went. One thing led to another. Um, one thing we found out later, first of all, was that MTV is known to be a channel that missed the train. Okay, so they can cross all the red tape and give you all the green lights in the world. They'll still be like, fuck, we waited too long. Mm. Now somebody else did it, which is exactly what happened. And if I remember correct, again, and this is what I've got all this information from Paul. So I'm telling you what I was told back then. Apparently, what really happened is the girl that was the director or producer, whatever it was, the main girl that was on our project was a little, she was on a lower level in MTV, okay? But she was representing our show. Not only that, this is back when Osborne's went down. Mm. So they played it off as like, you guys will be the next Osborne's, straight up. From what? Dude, from Kerry King doing our music to Phil yeah. Selmo being with us, you name it, okay? Yeah. They had all the interest in the world to do it. Of course, it was Paul Booth. There was no Kat Von D. There was none of that. Ami James is one of my best friends for many years since Israel, okay? So that's besides the point, okay? What happened is, according to them, that same girl... It's show business. Went to TLC and told them, hey, I got an idea for you guys. And I got an idea for episodes for you guys. And she basically sold them all the script that we gave her for two months straight and shoot. From The Apprentice to this to Art Fusion to you name it. You can go down the line. And this is how TLC came out with Miami. Now, TLC... Went to a lot of studios and a lot of very recognized artists back then and tried to deal with them, of course, first. They all said exactly what Paul said back then when everybody still had integrity, at least, or most people I looked up to, which was, fuck you. We've been working our whole life to be more artistic. Why would we put back the bimbo in the chair with a stupid story for a 15-minute tattoo. Yeah, yeah. But again, like I told you before, we both know this is what entertainment is all about. The same way like Kim Kardashian is more famous than the queen of fucking England. It is what it is. TLC jumped on it because TLC did American Choppers and everything else, and they knew by then what business is like. So they jumped on it. Eventually, they got to my friend Ami. Then I really don't know how, which... My friend Ami has always been, we've been good friends for many, many years. I love the guy to death. But he's a very different, he was um, apprenticed and stuff by people. They're old school tattooists. It wasn't about the quality of the work and everything. Tattooists used to be a businessman. It used to be like, yeah. I'm going to take your money and give you a tattoo. that You're going to feel the best tattoo ever. And I'm going to take every dollar in your pocket. That's just the way this industry used to be for a little a while. And again, there's nothing wrong in it. It is what it is. With that being said, Ami still lived in Miami. People like Chris Garver, Darren, uh, Yoji back then, may rest in peace. 
Um, I knew all these guys from work in Miami. These guys were great, amazing people those very day. Um, none of them lived in Miami anymore other than Ami. They hooked up Ami. Ami called his best friend. They go, why don't you come down to Miami? I got a thing going on. Mm. And that's how Miami Inn came about. But how Miami Inn came about, MTV was like, we know we grin light you and everything, but we kind of missed the train. Yeah. So the next thing was, fuck it. We're going to be the first TV show ever on the internet. Which means recaps, B-rolls, blah, blah, blah. So they threw whatever extra money and brought another cast on us and filmed us for another one or two months. It's Again, brother, I'm not going to lie to you. This is not who I am and no, what I am. No. With all the money and with all the expo, this is way before Lior Super was Lior Super. I was going to follow Paul blindly. He was my mentor. Um, he still, no matter what he gave me and everything, this was probably, and it was the good two years before I even left him. This was one of the first big punches in my life to be like, what's going on here? This yeah. is that. I thought I worked for Slayer, not Aha. Uh -huh. It was what it was, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It was, and again, there was all the pep talks and the bullshit and the. I really don't want to go on any official file to even tell you what that pilot looked like, the green light and everything. Um, I can only tell you that the opening song was the Green Day version of What a Wonderful Day or something like that. Oh, Is that what it's called? God. Okay, that should give you a good idea yeah. of what the whole pilot looked like. Um, so it was what it was, and again, even going online, they released a few clips here and a clip, few clips there. By then, Inked also started, uh, the, the, the one back in Vegas or whatever. By then, there was not even, yeah, they could have still made it happen. Um, and if I remember correct, what really put the kielbasa on that one, or kielbasa, however you say it. MTV is owned by Viacom. Yeah. And Viacom came in one day and ran all the fucking boats. Viacom went a shit in MTV because of, again, MTV were such idiots that have been known to miss the train. Mm. So Viacom came in and fired a million people on MTV, including the main guy on our show, Including, which has been an MTV for over 20 years, mind you. They went a shit and fired clean house, did what Trump promised about draining the swamp type of deal in MTV. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. this was the end of Paul Booth's last riots, tattoo theater uh, thing. I don't even want to go on a personal level of how much shit me as an apprentice did for it and the amount of weeks and months I've spent of doing the logo for it and all sorts of shit. And this is how it went away. Um, needless to say, it kind of destroyed Paul in a way and then Kat Von D became Kat Von D and Ami and then I suddenly got shit as if I'm giving shit to Ami when I was like, dude, he just happens to be my friend. I didn't go and tell anybody anything. <laughs> it became too much bullshit. And to really, again, be, maybe the, to close the story more than anything before I go into any other detail, which again, I know what I know for a very specific uh, direction. Yeah, so yeah, I can't yeah. tell you whether it's true or not. Um, at the end of the day, just like I told you why we left probably about a year and a half later or whatnot, or something like that. There was too much bullshit and not enough substance for the juvenile head that I am and the shit yeah. that got me to Paul to begin with, which was being the real deal, being one of us, being, <laughs> like you said about Glenn Benton, you know, dude, I was a kid. I, I was younger. Yeah. I was there. I bought everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And remind me later, and I'll tell you something that Ami told me years before that when I moved to New York. Um. And again, Ami is an old school tattooist. I'll just I'll, I'll put it in a very little nutshell. Again, I'll tell you this off camera. 
Ami called this a few years before. Not about himself. About what Paul's intentions were. Just as being a tattoo artist. Being like, yeah. we're a tattoo artist. This is what we do. We do one, two, three to sell what we sell. Just like any other entertainment. There's nothing bad in it. <clears throat> but at least for me back then, it was like, no, man, this is the real deal. I really, really hate to have this coming out of my mouth and whether it's the alcohol or me or just me not giving a fuck at this point. I'm afraid to say this, dude, again. People have proven to me in my life who is real or not real. Sadly, I think Ami was right. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, and this yeah, is the reality yeah. of it. And I've known someone like Ami, I've known for many years. I've known all these guys in the TV shows I've actually known for many, many years. I think most of the TV shows went to who deserved it to who yeah. really you know, i've known ami for many years and he's a great artist and a great tattoo artist but he never claimed to be one yeah he's always like ami will be the first one to be like the way he looks the way this you dare to make money fair enough okay? yeah all the power to you and you know what more than that and again people like us and people that like our shit might give me shit for this but dude Real friends are real friends. And you know what? When Ami had Miami Inc. And when Miami Inc. was not on the air and the B crew was working in the shop and making tons of money, had a little gold mine, he called me and he called any one of his friends and be like, please come guest spot for a few weeks, make tons of money. Again, I'll probably tell you, I never did. It's not <laughs> my gig. Yeah. With that being said, I'm still begging people right now to fucking have me do their art and other shit while we're going through this Corona bullshit, but I'm doing okay. Yeah. But it is what it is. And it, it fell into the right hands of who needed to do what it needed to do. It was what it was. Um, from the minute that Paul even mentioned the idea for me before he even tried shopping it, you know how people like us are, we're like, what? We don't even have cable. Why the fuck would we be on a TV show? Yeah. You know, so. All I keep thinking about is we never. For a reason or not, and I'm like, at least on my level, I'm like, dude, yeah. I'm thankful for that. Again, the reason I met you, the reason a few friends or a few places are where I am or who I am, for good or bad. I'll take it at this point because you know what? Again, at least I have one thing that sadly a lot of people when they get older, they don't. And again, I'm not judging them. And in my own juvenile way, at least I have my fucking integrity. At yeah, least I can yeah, tell yeah. you that juvenile enough, I still do the shit that I wanted to do when I was 16. Yeah. That's really all I come down to. You know? <laughs> we, never, we never got the opportunity to see a uh, a girl strolling into the shop and you going up to her and saying, what, what, what can I do for you today? He's like, well, my dog died and I, I just really want something to remember him by. And you put this big demon, like <laughs> werewolf face on her arm. Look, it's, and, and like I said, I'll be the first one to admit it. Look, I don't think any, personally, not personally, dude, I'm tattooed by, like you say, Miami Inc. I have tattoos on me from Ami, from Kim Scarver, from Darren. Those are all friends. Those are all people I've known way before the show, and I still know them now. I still talk to them now. They're still the same people. I give them that. Unlike the majority of people in this world, I'm more than happy for their success. What I take from it and what I'm happy from it is, look, it's... You can love them or hate them, but you know what? At the end of the day, with all the bullshit, with all the Kardashian bullshit of it, it brought tattoos to where it is now. It, it Tattoos used to be, you know, how people used to get tattooed in the summer because they used to see people on the beach and be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what TV shows did, whether you like it or hate it, suddenly all tattoo studios, for good or bad, were packed all year long because it yeah. was on your TV. I don't know, and I don't, I, I'm not one to speak for any of them. I don't know who's any of them, if they cared or not cared or cared only about their own ass. But it did bring to this. So you should take it for what it is. The same way that I look at our situation now, 
honestly think that this whole virus crap or whatever, I don't want to talk about what I think about it or not, but I think that the situation that we're at now is going to be actually cleaning house of what that started. Mm. Okay. In my opinion, if you build enough of a brick house, and again, dude, I build a brick house, they still got to pay for every month. Don't get me wrong. This is not, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm not bringing a brick house that I own. But my take from it, the same way that my take from stupid Trump being a president is that, you know what, the good thing of it, that at least you can tell your kid tomorrow that, yeah, you too can be a president. <laughs> it is what it is. And believe me, I'm a pessimist. I'm not one to look at a half full or half empty bottle of Jack that I have here. Yeah. But I think that in the long run and the TV shows and everything that they did, and again, we're just not the kind of people to be on that end. You know what I mean? No. We're not going to like, I don't want my name on it. And I'm proud to not have my name on it. Um, and there's a give and take there. But I think the same way that our situation now, in my opinion, at least, will in turn kind of clean house halfway through it. And some people realize, eh, we thought tattooing was super cool to be a tattoo artist. You'll be on TV. Suddenly we realize those fuckers are starving now. Maybe I shouldn't be a tattoo artist if I'm not willing to be one. Yeah. Maybe I should get a real job or whatever you want to call it. And you know what? That, it, it, again, maybe it's because I'm older or whatever I've been through. It is what it is, you know? And, and I think it, it does the trick. And I think it will clean a lot of the people that shouldn't be in this industry. And a few people have been in this industry long enough or that's really what they want to do. They'll still be there in another month or in two months or in six months, even if they don't work. Well, a lot of other people will be like, oh, that sounded cool. But then look at all these starving tattoo artists now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should be a graphic designer. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a good idea at the time. Well, so my my kind of journey, because you, you were the first guy that tattooed me. But I had I had started following your work on uh, Paul's website or Paul's original website, um, and the reason I had done that is one of my uh, best friends got tattooed. Get out! And I'm Paul. sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I do gotta give him his credit. You realize Paul Boots is one of when Paul Boots started his website, DarkImages.com. Yeah, only three tattoo sites on all of the internet. I, that that guy, I mean. R- regardless of him as a person he, sorry it was he, 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 com, Paul, uh, darkimages.com and i think bme that yeah, was it yeah. the whole internet yeah but well, he yeah, uh, he, he absolutely i mean as a, yeah I, I agree with you you know completely blazed a trail but i so i i would go onto darkimages.com i i I would look at his stuff and then I noticed they, there was a link with yours on and I started checking out your stuff and I just, I just really responded to that. And I must've looked at that for a good seven, eight years. And then it was just randomly one night. I just stood up and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to see if this dude's, you know, I'm going to see how I can go about getting tattooed by this guy and dropped you a MySpace message. And, and, and that's literally how, how it happened. But I had, I had been been scouting you out for about eight years, checking <laughs> checking out your work, and then eventually it happened. But the thing that I I I love so much about the tattoo that you gave me, and I always say to people because I only have two tattoos: I've got the one that you gave me, and I've got the one Dan gave me. Yeah. But both have a, a very different. They, they, I get a very different satisfaction from them. The one from Dan, you know, technically is is beautiful. It's a very you know it, it's it's a it's a very exquisitely done art piece. Mm-hmm. But the one that you did for me why I think that will always be the one that'll probably be the, the, and it's no disrespect to Dan, but always be the one that'll be the most special to me. It feels like, and I, I, I really don't want to sound like I'm, um, like I'm getting mushy here, but <laughs> now, that, now, now that I'm in my forties, I, I can probably afford to be a little more like that. But it, I, I always explain to people, it, it genuinely felt with that tattoo, like you and I had, had, had hit it off and, and just, you know, we, we'd kind of uh, connected and become friends almost straight away. Mm-hmm. And I felt like the the w- what came out in that tattoo was absolutely my personality. I, c- I can't think of somebody who was who, who would have been able to capture that better and who would have brought so much emotion out of a picture. And, and to this day, I still look at it and it, there is just something, it, it, I, it, it, it grabs me in the same way that music grabs me. And that's, yeah. I think that's, that's not something I could very easily say about, 
um, about art generally, but certainly not about tattoos. And like I said, I, I adore this, this Dan Marshall piece that I have, but there's just something, there's there's something about the about the demon Spartan that uh, just uh, you know, speaks to me on uh, a different level. First of all, thank you. This is, it's beyond humbling. And like I said, even though I stopped my antidepressant about eight months ago, I'm not going to break into tears here. <laughs> First first of that's of actually all, what I was going for. <laughs> first of all, in my opinion, and again, the same way like I just told you now about the TV show and other shit in my life, I've been on both ends of this, okay? I've chased Paul Booth since I was 16 to get tattooed by him, okay? I was a kid in Israel, not even apprenticing for tattoos the first time I heard about it. So I've been on both ends of this, and this is why it means so much to me to hear this, and you're not the only one that says this from... And again, sadly, look, I, I can't lie to you. I, I don't know where I would have been one way or another if I would have done things different. Uh, maybe I would have been happier if I wasn't Metallica living in a fucking mansion right now and laughing at the world, being like, oh, I don't care. I'm like, cool. I really don't know. Okay, like you said, I'm in my 40s. But this is where I came from. And this is one thing, uh, you know, I told my mom this a few years ago. And she's like, man, you're still depressed. And so this goes, dude, I'm clinically depressed. And I explained to my mom too. And I'm like, mom, let me tell you one thing that you should know for the rest of my life, that even if I died tomorrow, I've accomplished more than I ever imagined. And I've done more in my life. And I, at least like, you, like I told you earlier, I got one thing that a lot of people can say in older age, and again, it came in a, it still comes to the price on any given day. I have fucking integrity. It, 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 it's, I'm, I'm, like you said about Pantera being juvenile. Dude, I'm proud of it. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of being that. With that being said, there's one sentence to really put all this in proportion, perspective, whatever. My wife always makes fun of me because my English is terrible, so I don't know which way it is. You know what's the difference? They say one simple thing. You can help a, you can help a friend move, and you can help a best friend move a body. That's the difference. Yeah. You can have a bartender and talk to him and spill your heart and everything else, and you can spill your heart with a tattoo artist or something. When I walked into Laugh Riots the first time, and it was dude, it was one room and the rest of it was brick. It was not, he was just putting it together. So he's like, fuck it. And he just drew on me for a few hours. And then I came into this house a day later. They drove me into the house. Two hours in Jersey. I came from Miami. Dude, I've chased the guy since I'm 16. This was me being 21, finally 22, whatever it was. And I came in the guy's house from the fake dead bodies hanging and the fucking dinner we had on the dinner table that he used to call dinner table, the full-on embalming table with a church pews on the side, Okay. And I was like, my wife was like, fuck me, I'm going to have a nightmare forever. And I was like, home. The mm. same way I felt the first time I walked into that tattoo convention. First way I felt I ever walked into a metal festival or concert or whatever. There's a different level to it, at least for me. And, and you know, I, I, I try to do this till this very day, like I said. Dude, I'm getting so much shit from so many people now. I don't care. I'm proud of it. I, I'm okay with it. From the first tattoo I ever got, um, and I remember reading a few interviews with a few artists that I really looked up to back in the day and said kind of the same thing. And they're like, you know what, dude? You can make a tattoo or an art. It's not 100% perfect. And maybe the outline's a little warped and blah, blah, blah. The experience. The experience that comes with it, the rites of passage that comes with it, the, the, the whole thing around it, which is, in a nutshell, what me and you have been talking about for fucking years now. Mm. And the same way that, dude, three hours ago, I told this my wife, because she goes, oh, all these people are freaking out because uh, Hellfest got canceled this year. I don't know what's the big deal. And I'm like, Cause you're not a real metalhead, and she's like, oh, "I'm sorry, I'm not that cool." And I'm like, "Yeah." She's like, "I don't know what's the big deal." I'm like, "The big deal is the fucking Hellfest in Denmark this year was supposed to have Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and the Merciful fucking Faith. This is what's the big deal." 
And I'm sorry I'm being a 12-year-old, but if you do not understand those three names that I've never even bothered looking, who else is playing that festival and told you, yes, I'm going to sell my house for it, <laughs> then you don't understand. Yeah. And again, me being Israeli and me being New Yorker, me being a lot of things, and the big guy that I am, it might come across like I think I'm better than you. I'm not. I'm really not. But in my own juvenile way, and in the own way that you're like, fuck, what happened? I used to think this and that when I was 16. Dude, this is what makes people like us. Mm. It's those little fucking things. What you're telling me now is beyond any compliment I can ever get from anybody being like, you know what? Like you said about the thing I posted. First of all, it's not finished. There's a couple of little touches, but it's... It drives me insane. There's so much shit there that I want to do different. There's so much mm. shit there that there's a paper that I happen to have here because I can't order any other paper. There's material that I work with in charcoal that I know I'm capable of more and doing in pencil, but it's not going to be as black. There's so many factors that I'm sure, again, your podcast about music, I'm sure, and this is, again, I told my wife, I told a lot of people before, I choose not to know anything about music because I want to fucking have the experience we had as a 12 year old. Yeah. I want to have the experience to be like, fuck yeah, or fuck no, for whatever reason, I'll judge it later what I feel about it or how I think about it. And hearing you say it, hearing a lot of people say it, um, yeah, dude, it, 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 it's really, you know, I, I, I rather, and, and again, I'm old enough to even apologize for this, which I shouldn't. I don't want to be Metallica. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to, you know, like I told you, I've been, I've been cooped up, not really cooped up again. I've never lived in a house up here for four months. So sitting in my backyard is not too bad. We got a dog a couple months ago. It's, it's really not. I should not bitch about this. But being locked up here for about a month and a half now, or a month or whatever since I came back from New York, um, it, it, it is what it is. Yeah, it's those little things that make the difference to us. And you know what? After a month of you're making art or not art, it amazes me of how many people likes the one thing I did. And I'm like, really? I'm really not that happy with it. Because I know I'm capable of so much more. If it was a different yeah. medium, if it was a tattoo, I know I am. I'm glad to see the reaction. I'm glad to see that it is what it is. And at the end of the day, I'm glad. And again, that goes to all these Slayer fans and D-Side fans and all us juvenile fucking metalheads that can hear why Cradle Filth is not as heavy as you think it is. Some stuff is. It's those other things around yeah. it. It's beyond yeah, the yeah. shock value. It's beyond. It's the expression. It, it's a lot of things comes out of our heart, our souls, our whatever. And, it, you know, the transcend from there. And, and the fact that, like, dude, I can still make a living out of being an artist, fucking praising all hail Satan and fucking drawing dead babies. Fuck me, dude. That was what I wanted to do when I was 16. I'm 43 years old. That's amazing to me. Way beyond any levels. I'm sure it would have been nicer to do have a fucking backyard pool or whatever the fuck it is. Some people have kids or families or whatever. Um, I think it was... Um, uh, what's his name? The original bass player from... Not the original, but the bass player from Metallica... Um, uh, Jason Newstead? Houston. Yeah. You just said something very accurate to the way I feel about it. And he said something that when he broke up from Metallica, Metallica went on a different road because they had families and they had other shit and other, they were in a different place in life. He did not put them down. He just said they were. And he said something very correct, at least about my own self. And he said, look, dude, my music and my art is my kids. And I made a point to do that since I was a teenager. And I'm proudly still standing by it. And this was my issue with it. 
that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? So what you just said. Yes, this makes sense to me because I look at the other artists around and other shit that people can do and do out there. And just like any other artist, you can't read your own shit. You know, there's a level that like, you look at yourself in the mirror, you're like, oh, I didn't age that much. You're like, hey, you age a lot more. <laughs> Think about Jesus Christ. Yeah. It. <laughs> but this is the little shit again in a nutshell that, yeah, no, this means the world to me. Um, the same way that that yeah like any other little shit and i'm like it's not about selling out nothing whatever however you want to put it in words this is beyond words yeah this is beyond the same way we talked about dancing about music about other shit you get it or you don't yeah it's as simple as that and and it is what it is and it's even sadder to see. And again, I, I we getting older so we can even see that other end of it and understand, sadly, what we didn't when we were younger, why people do sell out or whatever you want to call it. Um, that's the biggest pride of my life. It's, it's the biggest, like I said, if I die two minutes from now, I'll still be happy to be the guy that was still like, I still held to my own shit. That that's really all I got. And you know what? It's I look at older generations and people before us and shit. Not for nothing. Yeah, they used to be realer people. They used to be people who are really yeah. believed in it. Whether they believed in their countries, their politics, and whatever it was, but they were willing to die for it. They were really, you know, the kings back then did not stand in the back and through their little guy's head. They went ahead. They went before them. Be like, no, this is who we really are. Even if they're 80 years old, they still rode in front of the fucking 20 years old. Mm -hmm. I respect that. I, I really, you know, and again, I, I, I can break it down to you the same way you can break it down to me. We all have our own reasons. Um, it, it is what it is. And you know what? At the end of the day, yeah, that's the little bit I can take from it and be like, you know what? At least I have that. And again, for somebody that's like manic depressive and blah, 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 and whatever you want to call it, that's the one little thing that every single day I wake up, I remind myself where the fuck you came from, where you are now, and put things in perspective. You know, the same way that, like I told you, a lot of people are like, oh my God, we've been at home for a month. On the internet, you motherfucker. At <laughs> yeah. home, eating the food. Watching, watching Netflix, eating, you know food, I mean? fucking around. All right, brother. Well, listen. It sound like, oh, we've been locked up. It's like I have friends that's been locked up for ten years. You do not know what locked no, up is like. Absolutely not. I don't know what it's like, but like, please step the fuck back. And it's like I watched a lot of. I love World War Two and shit, dude. I watch yeah. documentaries. It puts things in perspective of yeah, how yeah. bad can bad get. Yeah. Watch a yeah. watch a watch any documentary about the First World War and guys in the trenches. Then then yeah. compare that to being quarantined in your fucking fancy it's, flat. It's your fancy out of control. Room. It's out of control. And uh, the, a friend of mine, a tattoo artist, just posted it. His grandfather was in Punar, which is just, it's a terrible thing from World War Two. And he said it flat out in Hebrew. It's a little harder. He said it flat out, and I know it from a personal level. Just a lot of us that grew up in Israel, those people never got out of it, dude. Mm. They still screamed and cried every night of their life. There's a whole different perspective of what people think of, oh, poor me. It's like, why? Because you ran out of toilet paper. You have a fucking shower, dick. Go wash your ass. <laughs> the, the broadband went down while you were midway through an episode of Breaking Bad. Yeah. Fucking hell, man, you know? But it's like, it, it is what it is. I'm like, again, it's... You you do you, but it's like just shut the fuck up. Seriously, you know we have it pretty okay now, and it's just it is what it is, and it's it's the same thing again about music, about art, about whatever it is. I'm like, dude, if you think this is the worst that ever happened to you, you must have a beautiful fucking life. That's all I can say, you know. Yeah. Like, must be nice seeing you. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, brother. Well, listen, I'm going to uh, I'm going to let you go. Thank you once again for coming on. Uh, it was fucking great catching up with you as always, and we will definitely do it again at some point, uh, some point soon. Hey, hey, brother, it's always nice to talk to anybody nowadays. For fuck's sake, <laughs> I can't wait to leave. People in well, Denmark don't speak as much English as you think. I think uh, I think probably next year at some point. You know, I, I don't know where we'll uh, wh- whether we meet in Denmark or whether we meet in London or whether we meet in New York. Uh, I think. Uh, I think we uh, we should probably start talking about extending my uh, my arm down. Um, I'm going to tell I'll you what you know. I tell a lot of people nowadays. And again, as a pessimist, it's very weird for me to say this. But the one thing we take from this stupid times is enough with the next year, next year, next year. I will see you sooner than later, brother. That's really all it is to it. Fuck this whole planning. As soon as they fucking pull this shit out, we'll see each other. For sure. Awesome. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much. Take care of yourself. You too, brother. Soon. Be good. Bye-bye. Stay metal.
you so much to Lior Sofer for coming on the show. And uh, as you guys saw, whenever he and I speak, uh, we usually have a lot to tell each other. Uh, well, certainly he has a lot to say. Uh, lots of fun catching up with him. Uh, and if you do want to check out his stuff, uh, he's recently relaunched his website. Uh, it's www.liorsofer.com. Um, and you can uh, have a look at some of the uh, art that he's done, some of his tattoo work. Um, I know that once this uh, coronavirus bullshit has lifted, um, he will be back out on the road. So you can catch him at a uh, tattoo convention, um, you know, where, wherever he's guesting at the time. Um, and uh, like I said, he's, you know, I've got his ink on my arm. So uh, I certainly endorse his work. Um, and he's just a fucking badass guy. It's great talking to him again. Um, Speaking of badass, let's talk about some new music. I want to chat first and foremost about the new Ulcerate record, Stare Into Death and Be Still. Uh, Ulcerate, of course, from New Zealand and now signed for, uh, to Debumur Morty Productions. Uh, their lot, previous record came out on Relapse. Um, Debumur Morty, I have to say, um, I know I talk a lot about Season of Mist, but uh Debra Mamorti, as far as consistency and and being able to pick out great talent uh are surely not far behind that label um they've got uh, amongst others uh some of my favorites uh Blue House Nort Outer uh I think they also recently signed Selbst out of Venezuela um Selbst are going to do their second record fairly soon um and I have spoken to them about coming onto the show um so, so that'll hopefully happen once that album is released but either way 100% check out those bands uh, and 100% check out Ulcerate. Um, I'm actually surprised by the amount of hype that is around this album. I mean, considering the fact that this band is uh, from New Zealand, um, you know, this is uh, you know this is their sixth album now, and they they have been consistently getting very very good reviews, and they've you know I think all of their records are very well received. Quite a few people I know have seen them live, said that they are spectacular. But I still felt like they were sort of floating under the radar a little bit um, up to the point that this record came out. Um, as I said, obviously, you know, change in label, uh, it doesn't really mean they've changed their sound in any way. As a matter of fact, I'd say if you compared Stare Into Death and Be Still to uh, some of their earlier work, uh, you know, particularly albums like uh, Everything Is Fire and The Destroyers of All, which came out in 2009 and 2011, this doesn't necessarily represent a major step forward as much as it just represents a refinement of what they've been doing. So uh, the, the the style of death metal they make, as much as it's called technical death metal, uh, is definitely probably more on the melodic side. You know, if you think about a band like Immolation, I think that's a very good comparison. Um, you know, they're necessarily, I mean, this isn't brain drill or, uh, you know, just someone fucking around on a fretboard for the sake of doing so. Uh, which is not to say these guys don't know how to play their instruments. Uh, you know, I would say in in terms of of actual performance, um, this is probably the three guys in the band's best performance I, I've ever heard. I mean, you know, uh, Paul Kellen's vocals, as an example, are just absolutely ripping from start to finish. Um, and just, I think one of the things that really stands out for me on this album is just how much tighter the songwriting is, and how much more um, uh, self contained each song is. So, so what I mean by that is. One of my biggest issues with death metal for for quite a while was the fact that every single song just seemed to sort of bleed into the next, um, and you could get to the end of an album, and as much as the album was in, was enjoyable and the experience of listening to it was fun, uh, you you kind of never uh, you you could never kind of walk away from the record, you know, with any particular song stuck in your head. You know, it was all just one blur from start to finish. Um, I don't really think Ulcerate ever suffered from that, but what they what they've definitely done is they've they've kind of tightened things up to the point where every song on this record is is very distinguishable from the next. And as much as the songs are long, I think there's a lot of memorable bits in each song. There's a lot of hooks and there's a lot of things that stay with you uh, about each track. Um, you know, even you know after the first couple of listens. So, you know, I understand why so many people are so excited about this album. Uh, you know, it's going to take you only one or two listens to uh, understand that also. Um, I would highly, highly recommend that you listen to this uh, or that you check this album out uh, if you like heavy music generally. Um, and uh, to give you a taste of what to expect, uh, this is the opening track of the album. It's called The Lifeless Advance.
that was Ulcerate with a lifeless advance, uh, the first in the uh, Antipodean death metal double feature uh, that uh, the uh, review section of today's show is running. Uh, the next is a band that I've spoken about a couple of times on the show, um, in part because I was lucky enough to hear this album a couple of months before it came out. Um, it is, of course, Werewolves um, featuring the guitar stylings of a uh, friend of the show, Matt Wilcock. Uh, he is also in a Bremelin and the Antichrist Imperium. Um, and, uh, I mean, just an all-around fucking badass dude and a killer. Uh, and he is joined by two other killers, Sam Bean, who's also from the Antichrist Imperium, uh, and Dave Haley of Psychroptic. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the word around this record, obviously, and, and um, Dave, uh, Matt and I spoke about it when, uh, when he was on the show, uh, was that this was written in literally a couple of days. Um, and uh, I, I would say it, it doesn't sound like it was rushed. If, um, if, if anything, I think it's probably a testament to Matt's uh, talent and to the talent of the rest of the guys in the band that they could almost effortlessly produce one of the most ferocious, brutal, uncompromising, badass death metal albums that you can hear in 2020. Um, and and not only do that, but you know, have actual you know really solid songs on you. Um, you know, songs like Dog Knotted, uh, Establish Dominance, Beating Those We Despise. Uh, you know, it kind of gives you a, a, an idea of uh, of the in, intention of this record. And I know I said um, on uh, Instagram on I think on Saturday uh, that it blends together the subtlety of uh, Panzer Division Marduk um, with the uh, with the violence of uh vital remains is dechristianize but i really do almost think that that's um that's doing it a disservice um you know i think the spirit of those records are definitely pr present on yeah and i know that matt in particular is a very big fan of both um but the reason i say it's it's doing it a disservice is i think matt is starting to move into that echelon of guitar player where it's a little bit like um dime bag or trey from orbit angel uh, or slash where I, i've said this before there's there's guys that are technically proficient, and then there's people that it sounds like when they pick up the guitar, music just flows out of them. Uh, Matt Pike from High on Fire is another great example. Um, you know, listening to this album, you you really start to get that impression. Um, you know, for me, everything on this album is just spot on. The production is hard hitting and punchy. Um, uh, you know, Sam's performances are fucking spectacular. I think I mentioned this on uh, the interview with Matt as well. Sam, to me, one of the things I really like about his vocals on this album is the fact that his timing and the rhythm that he puts into his voice almost in a weird way reminds me of some older uh, hip hop albums where the the voice was the hook so uh, on a song like dog knotted which i'm going to play in a second um, you know he he's he's timing and the way that he phrases everything and the rhythm that he puts into his voice almost becomes one of the most memorable parts of the songs and then you know david haley if you've heard anything that he's done on psychroptic you know this guy is an absolute fucking monster um, you know, he, you know, he, in my opinion, he's one of the strongest drummers in the scene today, and he proves it on this album. So, uh, the dead are screaming by werewolves out now on prosthetic records. Um, you know, don't let the, uh, very tongue in cheek, um, you know, comments about it being Neanderthal metal and caveman death metal fool you. I mean, this is, you know, a fucking sophisticated killing machine and it is well worth you uh, getting a hold of. Uh, like I said, I'm going to play my favorite track off the album. This song is called Dog Knotted. Thank you. 
Werewolves with Dog Knotted off the Ferocious, The Dead Are Screaming, available now on Prosthetic Records. Uh, they are also selling a whole bunch of very cool merchandise on uh, various websites. So uh, check them out on um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, all the links are up there relevant to your country and uh, show them some love and support and tell them that Into the Necrosphere sent you. Uh, and then equally, you know, Matt, um, but also Sam and Dave uh, know this. You guys always have a standing open invitation to come on the show. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the new Antichrist Imperium album because that's also coming out later this year. Um, and that will feature uh, Sam and Matt in action once again. Uh, right, let's read some news. So we're going to do Metal Storm today. And uh, starting with uh, Alert Level Single Released, uh, the new Ministry. Um, so Ministry just released a new single. Uh, I listened to it and I was surprised. It was surprisingly good. Um, you know, I kind of lost a bit of love for Ministry after they uh, chose to um, flap on about Antifa on their last record. Um, but uh, this uh, this al- or this song at least suggests that if they do another record, it might not be too bad. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Lard, um, which was uh, the project that Al Jorgensen did with uh, Jello Biafra um, a, a couple of years back. Um, and uh, also some, uh, maybe some of the later Revco. But uh, yeah, very cool. And uh, apparently the record is due out on Nuclear Blast uh, in the next uh, couple of months. So uh, who knows, maybe a return to form for that band. Uh, Nursed debut full length available for listening. Uh, Nursed is another fucking spectacular Icelandic black metal band um, from a country that seems to be churning them out like there is no tomorrow at the moment. So uh, you guys will remember that I spoke to Halfro on uh, on this uh, on the show uh, about six episodes ago. Their new album is out now as well. Um, and uh, that Nurse record, I listened to uh, right around the time that uh, I heard Halfro for the first time. I think Black Metal Promotions actually posted a single, or they might have posted the whole record. Um, but either way, definitely check it out. It is absolutely magnificent. Um, Paradise Lost have released another single off of the forthcoming record uh, that they're putting out on Nuclear Blast called Obsidian. 
Uh, that's out on the 15th of May. The song is called Ghosts, and uh, I really, really like this. Um, I know that quite a lot of people will probably fucking despise every second of it, um, particularly those folks that, um, you know, want Paradise Lost to stick to the uh, death, doom stylings of the previous record and of the uh, the very early stuff. But, uh, you know, for me, I mean, this goes back to a sound that's probably more like a symbol than anything else. Um, it has a very sort of 80s goth vibe, which they're very open in admitting. Um, and I really enjoy it. Um, I, th I think that it's a style that suits them very well. I love the fact that Paradise Lost do something different on every album anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I would say, in my opinion, this is actually better than the uh, than the previous single. Um, I think the previous single was called Fall From Grace, and uh, I did like that. The only thing I didn't care for was the uh, was the music video. Um, but then again, Paradise Lost and music videos uh, don't seem to go well together. Um, the, uh, the the worst one they ever did, I think, was the music video for Faith Divides Us, Death Unites Us, which is literally a bunch of fucking losers staring into a camera crying. Uh, right, what else is there? Um, Catatonia premiere, the winter of our passing single. I'm not really bothered to listen to this. I actually kind of went off Catatonia for quite a long time. Um, but I have heard good things about uh, City Burials, the new album. Uh, so who knows? I might give that a try. Lamb of God release new Colossal Hate song and lyric video. Uh, I did listen to this also. Didn't think it was as cool as Memento Mori, which was the previous single. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in two minds about how this album is going to be. I still think that uh, Chris Adler's drumming added a fuckload to this band. And I think... Without it, um, they just lose a little bit of the urgency and a little bit of the aggression that uh, some of the previous records had. Uh, Malevolent Creation lineup changes. So, like I said at the top of the show, uh, on Wednesday morning, I woke up uh, to a whole bunch of uh, DMs on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram uh, with a couple of people asking me you know, what had happened to, um, to Lee and why he was no longer in uh, Malevolent Creation. I'd actually spoken to Lee on the Tuesday uh, because we were planning to have him on the show and then various things came up and I called him up just to say, can we reschedule? Um, he didn't mention anything then and I'm, I'm fairly confident that he would have said something if he had known uh, that, uh, that this was going to happen. Um, so I would assume that pr prior to this, uh, this statement coming out from the band, I, I don't think that he knew uh, that he wasn't going to be in the band anymore or at the very least that uh, they were going to have a chat to him before then. Um, but, uh, anyways, I jumped on Facebook and I saw the statement from the band. I saw the statement from him. Both seemed pretty cordial. Uh, Lee announced that he is going to be starting a new band called, uh, Unblessed Divine. Um, and then, uh, Malevolent Creation announced that Ryan Taylor of Solstice is going to be joining the band as well. Um, you know, very good front band by all accounts. Um, and then Ronnie Palmer, um, who uh, played drums in Angel Corpse, is going to be joining the band full time. Uh, I think Ronnie actually played... Uh, during the show that they did here in London. Um, and, uh, I mean, he was fucking excellent. So, you know, very good uh, very good hire from uh, Malevolent Creation for that. But, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, Lee and Malevolent Creation, it's uh, it then turned into one of those situations where it's a little bit like a, um, a divorce where, you know, everything is all civil and friendly until one person downs a bottle of vodka and jumps on Facebook, which is exactly what Phil Fasciana did on uh, on Thursday evening. So uh, he posted a um, a barely English rant that went on for several paragraphs on Thursday night where, uh, you know, first he accused Lee of talking shit about the band, which I had never saw any of that, and Lee certainly never said anything to me, um, and then went on to, uh, you know, uh, basically um, bemoan his, uh, his playing ability, said that he wasn't able to learn all the songs, uh, you know, spoke about his health, spoke about his hygiene and a whole bunch of other shit. And, uh, yeah, it just, uh, just got really nasty really, really quickly. Now, look, I mean, I wasn't on tour with him. I, I don't know what exactly happened and, and, you know, the reality or the truth of what happened is, is something that, uh, you know, only the guys in the band and, and Lee will know. Um, you know, I do know from, uh, you know, being of being Lee's friend that, you know, Malevolent Creation was, you know, or being able to front them was an absolute dream come true. Um, I know how excited he was, um, you know, when he first got given the opportunity and I saw them in London. 
Uh, and I thought the show was very good. Um, and uh, I had Giuseppe from Corpsing uh, with me at the time. You know, he felt the same, and, and everybody else around me seemed to feel the same. And uh, the crowd seemed to uh, seem to really respond as well. So, um, you know, whether or not these there, there's much there's there's a lot of truth to uh, some of the uh, accusations that's been hurled around. I think at the end of the day is uh, is almost irrelevant. You know, it, it it is what it is. It's sad that it had to come to an end uh, in the way that it did. Um, but these things happen, um, and uh, you know well, we will have Lee on the show again at some point in the not too distant future. Um, but uh, you know I'm going to make that conversation entirely focused around uh, his new music, um, you know, and some of the good memories he's taking away from his experience with Malevolent Creation. Because you know, no, no matter what the eventual outcome was, uh, it is still a hell of achieve a hell of an achievement for uh, a guy from my neck of the woods to end up fronting a band of the influence and of the stature of Malevan creation uh, you know which he which he did for uh, for 2 years so you know i'm not going to be involved or get in the middle of any fucking mudslinging bullshit and you know i, I think or well, i would hope lee feels the same and you know the other thing that i would say and uh, i know this is probably going to be perceived as a bit of a snipe you know in some ways i, I it, it probably is but i i i question how, where a 52 year old man gets the time from to uh, post the torrent of bullshit that Phil did on uh, on Facebook um, because it didn't make the band look any better and it certainly didn't make him look any better. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's my two cents on what happened. Best of luck to Malevolent Creation um, and I'm sure Lee will do well with uh, Unblessed Divine and uh, by all accounts, as I said, uh, Ryan Taylor is a badass dude and I'm sure he's going to do a great job uh, fronting with Evan Creation going forward. Uh, right, on we go. So, Mayhem announced Northern Ritual 2020 European Tour. Uh, I personally still think this is a little bit ambitious considering the fact that I, I don't know whether after this lockdown, um, you know, they'll immediately start lifting the, the limit off of large gatherings of people. I fucking highly doubt it, to be honest. Um, but if uh, if Mayhem do uh, do end up playing in the UK, which I think tentatively there's a date on their scheduled for London, I think for the 28th of October or something, uh, I will most certainly be there. Um, I'm not so uh, not so excited about Mortis opening for them. I saw Mortis opening for Combi Christ probably about eight or nine years ago, and he was fucking awful. Uh, I mean, I like some of uh, some of his stuff on um, Smell the Witch and the Grudge, but uh, live he just did not do it for me. Uh, Mayhem, on the other hand, most definitely do. Old Man's Child, new album in working progress. Uh, boo. Um, uh, I don't care about that. Old Man's Child, to me, is one of those black metal bands that falls into the same vein as Dark Funeral, Nargle Far. You know, all of those bands that just just lack the, the danger and the venom which um, you know, I, I enjoy in black metal, and ironically, Dark Funeral working on a new studio record. Yawn. Morbid. Ah, oh, this was fucking hysterical. So I know I spoke last week about Morbid Angel uh, releasing Altars of Madness. I don't know whether you guys saw, but uh, Trey was apparently arrested uh, on uh, New Year's Eve this year uh, for uh, for drink driving, and uh, when the cops pulled him over. Apparently he said uh, that it's fine because he's actually a professional drinker. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that was hysterical. But uh, anyway, I think that just about does it for this week. Thank you so much once again for uh, for joining the show, and uh, you know, I hope you guys enjoy what you heard. Like I said, uh, next week I've got Charles Elliott of Abysmal Dawn joining me, uh, and then in the pipeline I've got interviews scheduled with Damien Lesky of uh, of Broken Hope, uh, and then also with Katie of Season of Mist. Uh, she does PR for them in the states, and I thought it'd be interesting to get somebody from the industry on here to talk about how the coronavirus is affecting them, uh, you know, and probably also just to give some insights on uh, you know how uh, how shit works inside the belly of the beast, particularly for those of us that listen to the show. Uh, that have not been in a signed band. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy all of that. Hope you come back and uh, check out uh, some of the new episodes. Um, and if you're uh, new to the show, then uh, you know you can trawl through the archives uh, during these last few weeks of lockdown. Um, there's a whole bunch of very cool stuff in there from Jason, from Akrakaka, through to 
um who else do we have uh nathaniel from damim uh i've got several interviews with marco or several episodes with marco of stellar master elite uh giuseppe of corpsing um henry from god dethroned uh my buddy pavel from blaze of perdition um mike hill from tombs and a whole bunch more so uh hope you guys have a fucking awesome week stay safe stay healthy from the mean streets of surbiton on the outskirts of london I am bidding you a fond farewell.